As she poured a cup of coffee, two men burst in, one wielding a 30 caliber rifle. The boar Alexander was shot in the head. Coffee cup was still on the table after all the shooting. Her actual brains are blown across the kitchen. The gunman, still high from an all-night cocaine binge, stormed through the house searching for others. In a front bedroom, he gunned down 24-year-old Dietra Alexander, who sat frozen in her bed. The daughter was shot multiple times. Beside her, 13-year-old Damani Garner and 8-year-old Damon Bonner were asleep. Two boys were shot also in the head at point-blank range. The nephews had never even awakened. And they, they go up and are executed, still asleep. 13-year-old Ivan Scott hid in a closet as the men fled the house. Imagine what it was like for that little boy that ran into the closet when he heard the gunshots and comes out and sees all his family bloodied up. It's just horrific. The assailants were part of the Roland 60s, a crip set from the west side of South Central. On that summer morning, they were carrying out a hit in return for drugs and cash. And it turned out that they went to the wrong house. Could have been your house, could have been mine, could have been any place. They weren't particular about where they were going to do this show. The Crippen lifestyle had once again touched the innocent citizens of L.A. It becomes different value system where the value of life just didn't mean anything. And that was frightening to me. And a police interview with a high-ranking Crip only confirmed that fear. He took the police deep inside the violent mindset of the gang. The more mother we kill, the higher rank we get. And it's like every different gang, each Crip gang, want to be better than another Crip gang. So we all is striving to kill a mother not a Crip. Like all Crips, he had a deep hatred for the Bloods, a rival gang. The Bloods were smaller in number, but just as vicious. Crips referred to Bloods as slobs. He used to go to different other games, slob games, kidnap their homegirls, bring them to our set and rape them, torture them, tell them to go back and tell all your motherfucking slob homeboys that uh, the Crips is real. And as he told the police, once you joined, you were a Crip forever. Crippin was a permanent lifestyle choice. We always got to have unity and power over wherever we at. If you don't let a Crip have that, he'll go nuts. He, he wouldn't know how to act. I mean, he'd been so used to just going crazy, shooting, robbing, and killing, and raping, and stealing, and just squabbling. That's, that's been life for him. And that, that's something he'll never grow out of. In South Central, Lil Rick Scrippin had gotten out of hand. For five years, he'd been selling drugs for his set, the Gardena Paybacks. Along the way, he'd become addicted to his own product. I was just kind of in and out of jail, and my alcohol and drug usage had got, gotten deeper and still had the criminal and violent mentality. It was a very unstable lifestyle. In 1988, after being caught with guns and cocaine, Lil Rick was sentenced to 11 years in Soledad, a Northern California penitentiary. He was just 19 years old. I had hit the big house when I got to Soledad. I seen some things in there and uh, did some things in there that I didn't know I was capable of doing. I thought the wars on the street were insurmountable, but the wars that were going on in prison were just as profound, and they were just as devastating and just as violent. Lil Rick was out in less than five years. Once back on the streets, the battle he fought was against himself. I was kind of tinkering with wanting to straighten up and still leaning towards wanting to be on the streets. The balancing act was torture. He sank further into drug and alcohol abuse. The grip in life had finally caught up with him. I could remember days of just like wanting to blow my head off, man, based on I couldn't change my lifestyle. Lil Rick would have to hit rock bottom before he could rise again. And so would Los Angeles. 
The bloody decade of the 1980s was finally over, and in the most unlikely places, the tide started to turn. There was something different in the air. I felt it talking to some of these youngsters. That was a legit feeling that these guys wanted to, to make some changes. May 9th, 1988. Loops on my fingers on the trigger. Always ready for some sex tripping. That's while I'm dripping and dabbing, dripping and dipping. Never. Charlotte Austin was startled by the sounds of gunshots being fired outside her South Central home. I said, well, you know, I need to call the police because somebody's child just got hurt. But then it felt like something dropped from me. And I had this really strange feeling. Moments later, she was running down the street towards a car that was surrounded by police and paramedics. A red Pontiac was riddled with bullets. Her 13-year-old daughter, Jimmy, was in the passenger seat. I remember I went to open the door and the fire rescue stopped me. I thought they were gonna go get a gurney because they went back to the car. When they came back, they had sheets, and there was no body saying, your daughter's deceased, I'm sorry, none of that movie stuff. It just covered them up. Jami had been riding with her next door neighbor, Nikki Stover. Both girls were dead, sprayed with bullets from a nine millimeter Uzi and a pistol. The gunmen were members of the infamous Eight Trey Crips, one of the most violent sets of the gang. Their mission had been to kill the sister of a drug dealer who had ripped them off. They heard the sister was driving a red car. Afterwards, the shooters celebrated with their homies. They came back bragging about it, how they shot these girls and their heads were bouncing and we need a 40 ounce and get some barbecue and they were gonna have this party because they did this murder. The only problem was that it was the wrong red car and the wrong girls. That didn't seem to phase the gunman while they stood trial. The part in that case that really grab me is that for some reason the young men who were suspects in this case they never showed remorse even when these parents were talking about their children i heard sniggles the trial brought home a cold reality that shook even hard-nosed cops like ken bell i wondered where was the human fiber where, where was the remorse after the loss of her daughter charlotte austin turned her grief into action her ongoing mission has become to break the cycle of gang violence. On that, she is an expert. The day after her daughter died, Charlotte discovered that her teenage son, Corey, had somehow gotten a hold of two handguns and had planned to seek revenge. I had to sit him down and explain that that was not the answer, that he was only gonna make another mother feel the way I was feeling. Eight years later, Corey was shot and killed by a gang member for wearing the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood. They weren't in gangs. They, Corey wasn't in a gang. They were kids living in the neighborhood doing what they do. In the middle of this sea of hate were the Watts housing projects. In 1992, gang members and citizens inside the projects were growing tired of the violent world surrounding them. I think a lot of individuals in the different arenas, in the different gang sets, were really fed up of not being able to walk the streets, of brothers being shot, of mothers being shot, of sisters being shot. Leaders from rival blood and crip sets decided to start talking. With the help of law enforcement, they came together for a peace summit. We need peace. We need to stop the killing. That's the main we thing. Need peace of, black, we need peace among, a, among us black people because of the simple fact we all live in South Central. And if we kill each other in South Central, where, where else do we have to go? The two sides came to an agreement. The terms 
mutual respect and an end to the killing. Some say the peace that followed lasted a few months. Others say a few years. Truces between Bloods and the Crips never last too long. It's always something. But by all accounts, some neighborhoods were a little safer after the truce. In 1993, gang murders in L.A. were down more than 10 percent. It was a good period for the gangs in L.A. because we saw that they can't come together. There were other changes within the world of the Crips. In San Quentin, Tookie Williams, the one-time leader of the West Side Crips, had been on death row for over a decade. By 2000, Williams had renounced his criminal past and made a public apology for his role in promoting the Crippen lifestyle. I believe he, he felt responsibility, you know, the way things are today, no doubt. Williams co-wrote a series of children's books and launched a website with anti-gang messages for kids and adults. In 2001, his efforts earned him a Nobel Peace Prize nomination by a member of the Swiss Parliament. As Williams' execution date inched closer, celebrities latched on to his cause and rallied around an effort to overturn his death sentence. Others weren't as ready to hold Williams up as a role model. The image that bothered me the most about, you know, the whole Tookie thing was the image that he was the guy that was going to free Los Angeles of the gangbangers. And I say, bull crap. I, you know, there's guys who grew up with Tookie, who lived in that same era, who walked the same streets as Tookie, and never killed or was accused of killing anybody like that. On December 12, 2005, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger denied his bid for clemency. The next day, Stanley Tookie Williams was put to death by lethal injection. The sense of accountability that changed Tookie Williams was being felt elsewhere. Some original gangsters, known as OGs, were finally ready to move on. Lowell Rick survived jail time and substance abuse. Then, at age 33, he made a decision that changed his life. And I'm not this big guru or religious type dude. I just know something happened deep down in my spirit where I couldn't take it no more. I quit being influenced and started being an influencer. Since then, a lot has happened. Lil Rick joined up with other OGs who work with kids to improve their lives and communities. He says you can be against violence, but still be a crip. I don't denounce the cripping part. I denounce the negative energy. I denounce the killings. I denounce the bull in it. I love Crippin, but I'm clear that it went somewhere that I don't want to be. Lil Rick is not alone. I spent from 19 all the way to 29 in prisons, in and out of prisons. Now, today, uh, I'm trying to give back. The message is simple. It's time for us to grow up and raise up. If it's death you're looking for, then continue on, man. But if it's life you're looking for, you probably need to search somewhere else. In 2007, the LAPD released a list of the 11 most violent gangs in Los Angeles. Four of them were Crips, who remained the largest black gang in the city with over 10,000 members. And while people like Charlotte Austin and the OGs have made a dent, for every Crip who puts down a gun, another is there to pick it back up. This is what I was born and raised in. This is something you guys gonna never, ever be able to take this. In the minds of those soldiers, they feel this is a real war. You dig? And uh, how do you stop a war? I wish I knew. I wish I knew.